now at 11. Everyone's on the floor crying. Family tries to hold on to hope as their loved one is missing at sea. A Salem woman is worried after a stranger came into her yard and killed a pet rabbit. Portland changes the way restaurants can hand out straws. What you'll have to do to get one starting tomorrow. But first, a coaching legend in Oregon is found guilty of doping violations. Alberto Salazar is banned from the sport for the next four years. Thank you for joining us. I'm Laurel Porter. And I'm Dan Haggerty. Salazar, who coaches for Nike, is already saying that he'll appeal this ban. KGW's Catherine Cook showed us what led anti-doping investigators to this point. Oh, this is where the best runners in the country go. This it's been four years since Nike Oregon Project track coach Alberto Salazar first faced serious doping allegations. They stem from a joint investigation by the BBC and ProPublica. On Monday, following a four-year investigation and two years in court, the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency announced Salazar and endocrinologist Dr. Jeffrey Brown would both face a four-year ban. USADA CEO Travis Tigart said, quote, The athletes in these cases found the courage to speak out and ultimately expose the truth. While acting in connection with the Nike Oregon Project, Mr. Salazar and Dr. Brown demonstrated that winning was more important than the health and well-being of the athletes they were sworn to protect. In 2012, Salazar coached Central Catholic grad Galen Rupp to an Olympic silver medal in the 10,000 meters. In 2015, a former Oregon Project coach said he recalled seeing results from one of Rupp's blood tests. Under one of Galen's, it had uh, currently on testosterone and prednisone medication. Testosterone is obviously banned. Salazar and Rupp denied the allegations, and Rupp has never failed a drug test. The panel found that Salazar committed multiple doping violations. They include tampering with the doping control process and trafficking testosterone. That came from being involved with a testosterone testing program in violation of the rules. In a statement, Salazar said he was shocked by the outcome. Quote, the Oregon Project has never and will never permit doping. I will appeal and look forward to this unfair and protracted process reaching the conclusion I know to be true. In Southwest Portland, Catherine Cook, KGW News. All right, a lot to take in there. We want to know what you think about this. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? Uh, Salazar is getting a four-year suspension. Do you think that's a fair punishment, or is it too little or too much? Click the Vote tab on the KGW app or go directly to kgw.com slash vote to let us know what you think. We'll reveal the results later in the show. In a developing story tonight, a man from the Clackamas area is missing off the Oregon coast. He's an amateur sailor who worked as a student counselor at Franklin High School. Huang Tran went out on the water on what was supposed to be a quick day trip. He left Newport Saturday on a solo sailing trip. Thunderstorms moved in Saturday night and Tran never returned. The Coast Guard went out to search and yesterday afternoon someone spotted debris in the water 11 miles north near Whale Cove. The Coast Guard confirmed it belonged to Tran, but he and his boat are still nowhere to be found. Tran's wife and daughter said he loved being outdoors and on the water, even though they were concerned about his hobby. I see so many bad stories and I keep telling him that no, but I, uh, but he, he said that if he, so what? So what if I die? I love what I do. That's what he says. Mother Nature doesn't care who's out there. Whatever happens, it's just out of our control. So they are trying to hold on to hope, but they know the odds are long. The Tran is still alive. The Coast Guard called off the search around midnight last night. New at 11 o'clock. It's an anniversary. A Florida couple wishes they didn't have to acknowledge. Today marks five years since their son was gunned down in southeast Portland. And still, there have been no arrests in this case. KGW's Mike Benner spoke with the mother and father and joins us now with more. Mike. Well, I can tell you, Sandy and Jim Olson uh, tell me that Michael, their son, moved to Portland in 2009. He absolutely loved it here. He made a lot of friends. Life was really good. Then came September 30th, 2014. The Olsons tell me Michael was on a beer run during a bachelor party when he was killed. He was funny and smart and 
kind. Not a day goes by that Sandy and Jim Olson don't miss their youngest son, Michael. Some days, though, are tougher than others, as they explained from their home in Florida. This day is probably the toughest. Christmas is another day that's and his birthday. Birthdays, Christmas, and September 30th, the day Michael was killed. The year was 2014, the time 11.08 p.m. There was a shooting near Southeast 52nd and Woodstock. Officers raced to the scene only to find Michael dead from a gunshot wound. There was no, absolutely no connection or that they can find between him and whoever did it. It was just a random act of violence. All investigators will say is that Michael was gunned down during a robbery. Detectives have since released a sketch of the suspect, described by witnesses as a light-skinned black or Hispanic man. Really, this person needs to get off the streets. To think the gunman has yet to pay for the crime weighs heavy on the Olsons. We think that somebody out there knows something and we would urge them to come forward so we can get some answers. Those answers, the Olsons say, will give them the closure they've been desperately seeking since September 30th, 2014. One of those things you just never forget and hopefully you don't ever live through again and hopefully nobody else ever lives through this because I wouldn't wish this on anybody. All right, the Olson family and the Portland Police Bureau alike are asking for tips in this case. Crime Stoppers of Oregon is offering a cash reward of up to $2,500 for information that leads to an arrest. Laurel? We do hope they get some answers soon. Thank you, Mike. Now to get you caught up on today's headlines. If you want a straw at Portland restaurants, you'll have to ask for it starting tomorrow. A new policy kicks in that prohibits businesses from handing out any single-use plastic. Besides straws, that includes things like plastic utensils and condiment packets. This applies to drive through and to-go orders as well as dine-in orders. The city hopes this is a good starting point toward reducing plastic use overall. The boycott of Fred Meyer grocery stores has been called off. The union representing grocery workers reached a tentative contract agreement. The union wants better pay for workers in our region's biggest grocery chains. In the case of Fred Meyer, the union claimed that there was a gender wage gap that needed to be fixed. Fred Meyer has denied it purposely pays women less. We won't know the details of the deal until union workers vote on it, but the union says their main concerns have been addressed. The man who fired a gun at PDX during a scuffle with an officer last week is now facing multiple assault and weapons charges. The district attorney's office says a Port of Portland officer contacted Deshaun Seamster in the baggage claim area of the airport. Seamster then apparently turned away and reached into his pocket. The officer tried to turn Seamster toward him, but they say he ran into a revolving door, and that's when the struggle happened. Seamster's gun went off, hitting his own hand. The officer involved did have some minor injuries, but they were not related to gunfire. A Salem family isn't getting a lot of sleep right now after they say a stranger, a woman, snuck into their yard and killed their pet rabbit. Hattie Anderson says she was putting out some recycling when she noticed this woman in her yard. She chased her off, but saw the latch was open on the rabbit cage. Anderson thought maybe the woman had stolen one of the bunnies, but moments later she saw Ollie dead in the yard. This is my castle. You know, this is my place that we, you know, we built it three years ago. We tore it down and gutted it and did all this stuff. And it's, it's my place. And I was very violated that someone would come and do such a horrible thing to, to me as well as the bunny. The Marion County Sheriff's Office arrested the woman. She's facing several charges, including animal abuse. So this is kind of a strange bust to tell you about. A woman has been charged with selling shark fins out of a store in Happy Valley. Oregon State Police found the dried shark fins at Wing Ming Herbs on Southeast 82nd. 52-year-old Agnes Yu is charged now in the case. The fins can be used to make soup, but in 2011, Oregon made it illegal to possess, sell, or trade shark fins. Police say an estimated 100 million sharks are killed for their fins every year. A home builder is suing an Oregon man for half a million dollars because of negative comments he posted on Facebook. Wes Brooks hired Adair Homes to build a new house in 2017. The Pendleton man wasn't happy with the construction, so he decided to share his frustration online. He created a public Facebook group, including photos and video of his home. Adair didn't like some of the comments. In March, the company sued West for half a million dollars and demanded he delete the Facebook group. Adair claims it's defending its reputation and speaking up for its employees. Despite the lawsuit, the Facebook page is still up and running. KGW investigative reporter Kylie Boshi dug into the case. 
which raises some interesting questions about online reviews and what you can and can't say. If you want to see more, we've posted the full investigation on our website, KGW.com and the KGW YouTube channel. Tomorrow, a Cowlitz County firefighter who died while on medical leave will be laid to rest. Michael Zanefield was the Cowlitz County, the Cowlitz County Battalion Chief and had been with the department for 25 years. Zanefield died by suicide earlier this month. His family released a statement. In part, it says he was loved by many and respected by all. This tragedy does not define Michael's commitment to his family, peers, and community. Instead, we ask for this tragedy to redefine how mental health in first responders is looked at. Starting at 1130 tomorrow morning, there will be a procession from Kelso to Longview. It starts at the fire station on Vine Street and goes to New Life Fellowship Church on 42nd Avenue. If you or anyone you know needs help or somebody to talk to, the Suicide Prevention Hotline is always available 24-7. That number is on your screen now, 1-800-273-8255. When we come back, a birthday party some first responders worried would never come. It's, it's going to be amazing to see her grow up um, and know that we had a part in that. Deputies celebrate with a local family one year after they helped save a baby who stopped breathing. What a story. Plus, it is much more than a dairy queen for the Selwood, Westmoreland area. Yeah, these guys really take care of their customers, and uh, it's really sad to see this one go. Why it's closing after more than 50 years in business. And I'm Matt Safino. It is a cold night out there already. Temperatures in the low 40s around the valley, and yes, we are headed for the 30s. And I'll let you know what this has to do with this frost advisory.